Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. What then, Paul exclaimed to the church in Rome, are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction, and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be shut, and all the world may become accountable to God because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 3 verses 9 to 19. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Mark chapter 14 verses 43 to 52. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 201 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We've talked a lot about betrayal. And we've also mentioned to our listeners, Richard, that the biblical school is a school that is self-critical. And that this, in fact, as Father Paul discusses at length in The Rise of Scripture, is a pedagogical stand that if you're going to create fellowship in the wilderness... You can't just ask your enemies to strip themselves of their identity and their claim on power. You have to strip yourself of the same things so that you can meet in the middle, so to speak. And so as we're hearing the Gospel of Mark, we would be remiss if we didn't ask the question, what about Mark himself? Loyalty is of the essence. In Hebrew, pesha is not just sin, as in you commit this action or that action, pesha, sin, is essentially disloyalty. Disloyalty is the basis of everything. The problem is not that Adam ate from the tree. The problem is that Adam ate from the tree when God told him not to. The basic language of repentance is turning because you're on a path of a particular leader. If you turn from that path, you are potentially following another leader. This is the sin. And of course, we know now that Judas looked not to Jesus, but to the leaders of the synagogue. We know that Peter looked not to Jesus, but to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, as evidenced by his betrayal of Paul's teaching in Galatians and Acts. And there's another incident in Acts that pertains to Mark who was also called John. And at one point in chapter 15 in Acts, Paul didn't want Mark to come along because he was concerned about whether or not Mark was trustworthy. trustworthy. Trust was a big issue. And so Mark went with Barnabas. And Barnabas would ask for Mark very often in the book of Acts. But Barnabas himself was suspect. 
his loyalty to Paul, which is about the loyalty to the gospel. Paul the individual isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about that which Paul carried, which was the gospel to the nations, Jesus Christ. Mark was suspect. Barnabas was suspect. Everybody waffled. So now if Mark is rushing to write this gospel, which talks all about the content of Paul's letters, I think we've demonstrated pretty clearly, and it was very overt in this vignette about the betrayal, that Mark is picking up Paul's argument about the flesh versus the spirit. That's why you can't read it as some psychological dualism. It's a technical reference to Galatians that the flesh in Hebrew, basar, the flesh, sarka, sarx, is in opposition to the will of God carried by the spirit in the inscription written with the finger of God. This is what's at stake. So it's an important background to hear as we move into this section of chapter 14, because understanding this background is going to unlock some mysteries that to us don't seem very mysterious. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. This perfectly describes Judas's loyalty. Now, a lot of times we think, oh, well, Judas just went rogue. He had his own plan for how he's going to overthrow the Romans or whatever you want to say. The point is that he turned from Jesus and turned to Jesus's arch enemies who were the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Jesus's arch enemy in Mark has not been the Romans. He has not been fighting with the Romans. He has not been arguing with the Romans. He has been fighting and arguing with the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now, some of our listeners have asked, why are you guys so hard on Peter in particular? And the answer is that you and I aren't being hard on Peter among all of these folks who have been duplicitous. Peter is singled out in the Gospel of Mark by Mark himself. Peter is is the one who argues most vociferously that the one who betrays Jesus could not possibly be him. Yet, Jesus reminds him that he is the one who will deny him most vociferously when it comes to that time. Peter is setting himself apart, and Jesus is setting him apart, and every time he stumbles and falls. And if you're defending Peter in a text that is saying that everybody around Jesus is suspect, If you hear Peter cry later and you pity him, you're not weeping because you're concerned about Peter. You're weeping because you're concerned about yourself. This is the problem with pity or empathy for characters who are under judgment. Don't fall in the trap. Because if you give Peter a pass or you give Mark a pass under the guise of, you know, being compassionate, you're making yourself the judge. You have no right to comment on Peter in this sense. So please hear the text. It's a section where you're being told you're one of the betrayers. Oh, Peter had good reasons. Oh, Judas had his reasons why. It doesn't matter. You're either loyal or you're disloyal. You can't be disloyal with good reasons and call that loyal. It's not noble to make excuses for another person's sin. This is a false piety and people do it all the time. It's noble to take on someone's punishment. It's not noble to make excuses for their sin. When you're just making excuses because you feel bad, because their situation makes you uncomfortable, you are not acting out of love. You are acting out of self-preservation. This is a point that I have to keep making. And if you don't recognize this, this false mercy, you're going to do what everyone does and say, well, Peter wasn't that bad. It was really Judas who was the one who really betrayed him. And once you do that, you yourself are under the judgment of this text. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away under guard. I love the fact that it's a kiss because a kiss is an expression of loyalty, fidelity, affinity, fraternity, friendship. It's both a technical gesture in the ancient world and to some degree in the modern world. Especially if you watch The Godfather. A kiss (laughs) has a much different meaning. If you watch The Godfather, you understand the kiss in a Roman context, correct? And in that way, 
it shows how these gestures of sentiment and fidelity are kind of lip service, as Isaiah says. Again, when you are trying to defend Peter because you're trying to show that you understand him and you have compassion for him and go easy on him, you are giving lip service to mercy, but you are executing judgment against the accused Judas. It's a slippery slope. I really want to stress this because your relationship to this text, the way that you interact with the judgment of this text, betrays your attitude towards the weaker brother in real life. And we fool ourselves by giving a kiss and a pat on the back to the weaker brother all the time. And look, notice how clever it is. You sound compassionate when you empathize with Peter. But what is your compassion worth? And who are you to judge? Either to condemn or to exonerate. Who are you to judge? After coming, Judas immediately went to him saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. And this is how he betrays himself. It's become kind of cliche in our culture, betrayed with a kiss. But using the symbol of loyalty as the symbol of his disloyalty shows how poisoned he is with his own ego and his own ambition, that even the signs and the actions of loyalty are betrayed by the fact that he has thrown his lot in with the enemies of Jesus, only for Jesus to then be destroyed. I love what you said, the way you phrased it, Richard, that the sign of loyalty becomes the sign of disloyalty. This is the power of functionality in scripture. The philosopher wants to say a kiss is loyalty. But the kiss isn't anything. Just as when he says master, master, it doesn't mean that he's his master. That's not the loyalty Jesus demands. It's loyalty, it's fidelity towards the teaching that he carries. And that's why the link to Paul in Galatians and Acts with respect to the Gospel of Mark is so forceful. Because it's disloyalty toward Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, but in Galatians and Acts, it's disloyalty toward Paul's preaching of Jesus Christ. That's why you have to read these texts together, otherwise you'll never get it. They laid hands on him and seized him, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Notice, Richard, he didn't cut off his hand or his foot or his tongue. He cut off his ear. One of the members of the synagogue charged with the duty of pouring the living text of God's word into the ear of the Roman instead cut his ear off. It's technical imagery. How can you evangelize someone that you've prevented from hearing? And worst of all, you were supposed to pour the Torah into their ears so that they wouldn't wield the sword. And how did you prevent them from hearing scripture? By using the sword to cut off their ear. It's definitely a critique against the revolutionary mentality of militant Jews in late antiquity. From chapter 1, we've known the one desire that Jesus has had for his disciples, which is to spread the seed, which is to share the word. And rather than preach at this moment, they draw a sword, which has nothing to do with what Jesus has been asking them to do all this time. This is what's so deeply sad about this moment that people think, oh, he was just misguided. Actually, what this whole section is teaching is all the different ways you can betray Jesus. You can betray Jesus by saying, no, I'm not going to be the one to betray you. You can betray Jesus by going with the enemies. You can even betray Jesus by drawing a sword against Jesus's enemies. The only way that you can show fidelity, we're being boxed into a corner here, is to preach and spread the word. That's it. Every other person who thinks that they're going to be original in the way that they show loyalty to Jesus fails. You are presented here with two possibilities for revolution against the tyranny of Caesar. The first is to take up the sword. The second is not passivism, a la modern political passivism and 
passive resistance. Please don't say that about Jesus because then you don't know what you're talking about. The second that's proposed in Mark is to use the sword of the spirit in the place of the sword of the flesh. And the sword of the spirit is scripture. This is the calculation that God the Father is making in the Gospel of Mark. Yes, I could have my son fight back and put a sword in his hand, but that goes against my word. The Gospel is the weapon that gives life. They could take the sword and kill a few Romans, and then a few Jews would be killed, and it would just be get more violence. And here's the worst part of that violence. The one who takes the sword now might save his own skin, and even the skin of Jesus. But that's a selfish act. Conversely, if my son remains faithful to my word and does not shed blood, he will lose, and those around him might lose, as a soldier might lose on the field of battle, but the teaching will win, and then there'll be hope for the Roman polity and for the 12 tribes. So there's going to be loss in conflict. There's going to be loss when there's betrayal, but for what purpose? And I think the proposition of Mark, Richard, is that the best strategy, the long game, as it were, with respect to the occupation of Palestine in the first century by Caesar, the long game is not to defend the Temple of Stone with a sword. It's to sow the seed in hope that after this generation has passed away, it would give life for future generations. It doesn't matter if the temple in Jerusalem still stands in Mark. It matters that the word of our God, as Isaiah says, stands forever. And Jesus said to them, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. Even at this moment, Jesus' desire is just that they would listen to his teaching. You came out to fight me. But the reason why you came out to fight me is because you weren't listening. If only you were listening, you would not be coming out against me like I'm some robber. If only you were listening, you would see that I'm not the enemy of the people. I'm the enemy of the false teaching. You mentioned pacifism a moment ago, Father. He's not deciding not to fight back because he's a pacifist, but so that the scriptures could be fulfilled. The will of his Father. He is only there to fulfill fill this will as expressed in the scripture and so he doesn't fight back because the point is scripture the point is the gospel any action that impedes the gospel is that sin is that rebellion that jesus since he was teaching all this time in the temple has been trying to get through to the people which means that the true rebellion is obedience because it is the word of god that is controlling the situation not caesar and not the synagogue. This is a declaration to all that is as open as his preaching was. He's saying to them also, look, I never hid from you. Everything was on the record. Why now suddenly you finally figured out that this teaching poses a problem for you? Why couldn't you come ask me about it before when I was just teaching? You didn't notice that I was teaching and you weren't listening to me. Why all of a sudden is this a threat? but in classic Pauline style, if you will. Whether or not you were listening, it is on the record, and therefore it does apply, and whether you know it or not, it is controlling this situation, which means that you, despite yourself, are still accountable to what I was teaching. Absolutely. And they all left him and fled. This is the fulfillment of the betrayal, and this is where we get into the interesting part that brings us back around to Mark, Richard. A young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him. Remember that Mark was a young man. That's number one. But he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. Remember also that at the end of the Gospel of Mark, a young man appears at the tomb dressed in white. So there's a connection between the young man here and the young man at the end of the Gospel sitting at the tomb proclaiming to you the Gospel. Here we have... Mark's duplicity expressed by Mark as the author of this text, that he was following along, then he got caught, and then he ran away, which parallels what happened in Acts. 
But for those of you who feel so sad that all the disciples are bad guys and why are we calling this out, if Mark himself is presenting himself as a betrayer in the text of his own gospel... Everyone is a betrayer. Everyone's a betrayer. You're a betrayer too. That's the problem with Hellenism and your system of heroes and hero worship. Because you project your ego into the hero. It's the problem with the idea of a protagonist in Western literature. Because you find the good guy in the story and you project your ego into the protagonist. In scripture, the only protagonist is God. And you can't project your ego into God because, as we learn from Genesis, you are not God, Adam. So if the only protagonist is God and you can't project your ego into the protagonist and everybody else is wrong, if you start defending them for their mistakes under the guise of compassion... What you're really doing is fulfilling the Psalms against yourself and making excuses and excuses in sin for yourself. And this is essential, Richard, because this mentality is the basis for modern spirituality and piety. Everyone patting themselves on the back for their sins or conversely condemning each other for their sins. It's two sides of the same coin. There is one judge, and Paul will not judge himself until the time. Judas, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, everyone with Jesus, the guy with the sword, and the guy with the linen cloth, every single one of them betrayed Jesus. Don't think that you, the listener, are the big exception. Oh, I would have stayed by. I would have stayed by. You know what? There's a guy actually who said that. His name's <laughs> Peter, and we'll see in an upcoming episode what happens with him. Right, right. It could happen to you, friends. Thanks very much, Dr. Brent. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.